It is not every preacher at Northside that gets a stage designed specifically for them. <laughs> uh, nothing says Corey Scott like jungle theme, right? Uh, the tech team told me, they were like, wear something bland so you'll stand out. So I did. Um, well, I am glad to preach today. I'm glad that our lead minister, Wayne, uh, made it back safely from his time in Maasai land, Kenya. Uh, he made it back this last week, uh, so we're grateful for that. Uh, please continue to pray for our global workers in Maasai land, Paul and Pam Highfield. M many of you, I'm sure, heard that um, Paul got injured. He uh, fell. Uh, they discovered a pinched nerve in his neck. Uh, he continues to have a lot of pain. And uh, they still have a couple weeks left to go on their trip before they come stateside. And uh, that trip is grueling enough as it is when you're feeling well. I can only imagine uh, when he's in that kind of pain. So please pray for the high fields. Uh, today, what I would like us to do as we get started is to honor the word of the Lord. And so can we stand together? And I'm going to be reading from Lamentations chapter 3. I want to encourage you to have your Bibles out for this, whether it's on your device or, uh, or the Bible there. And uh, just have this handy, because though it's going to be on the screen, I want you to re uh, refer to this quickly, uh, because we're going to be coming back to it throughout our time together. I'm going to start in verse 19. This is the word of the Lord. Remember my affliction and my homelessness, the wormwood and the poison. I continually remember them and have become depressed. Yet I call this to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish. For his mercies never end, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will put my hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the person who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for salvation from the Lord. Amen. And you can have a seat. I want to start with a question this morning. The question is this. Have you ever had a good cry? I think I lost half the room. Uh, including myself, honestly. Uh, guys, we are not known for our good cries, are we? Um, you know, I have found that uh, even for guys, you know, we do cry, right? We do cry. Uh, but it's usually pretty ugly. And it's oftentimes a lonely affair. But I have found that um, when I cry, it's, it just kind of comes a little easier these days the older I get. Especially when you see like a really great story, like a moving story, a, a, a really powerful movie, like a manly movie, right? Uh, like Toy Story 3. Do you remember the scene? Do you remember the scene where um, they're, they're in the city dump and they're heading towards the incinerator and uh, things are not looking good for the toys and so they lock arms to, to face this... Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't do it. I can't even fake it, you know. Uh, I, I, I realize that it just, it gets weird, right? We, crying is weird. It's awkward. Weeping is just weird. That's kind of the glaring reality I'm trying to communicate here. Because, um, you know, whatever we try to do to get away from it, we might try to distract ourselves from weeping. We might even medicate ourselves so we don't weep. And I am not making light of that. I'm just saying that, like, we do everything in our power to get away from weeping. You know what I'm saying? Everything we can do to stay away from weeping. And here we find ourselves at the end of this series called Tears to Joy through the writings of Jeremiah. And uh, we, we know, we remember his nickname. Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. And there's only one way you get a nickname. You have to embody the message. And he certainly does that. But Jeremiah is constantly weeping over the state of God's people during the time when they were about to be invaded and conquered by Babylon. His weeping would continue as the people of Judah were led into captivity. And it's awkward. It's awkward when someone is weeping. It's uncomfortable for us to embrace it, especially the weeping of other people. But I believe that God uses it for a good purpose. And the book of Lamentations, written by Jeremiah, is going to reveal that to us. Hopefully you still have your Bibles open to Lamentations. And just know that this book... Uh, we're going to do a quick flyover 
the book of Lamentations. It was written just probably right after the year 587 BC. It is a book of lament. It is primarily a book of weeping, but it is also poetry. The book of Lamentations is written as a poem, and it uses the Hebrew, across, the Hebrew alphabet as an acrostic guide. James Smith who uh, wrote one of the finest commentaries I have ever read on the book of Lamentation. It's, it's actually the only commentary I've ever book, read on the book of Lamentation. Not really. Um, I, I have read two. And, uh, uh, but it's, it's one of the strongest commentaries I have on this book. I want you to listen to what he wrote in summary about this book, Lamentations. Liturgically, these poems served as the means by which the congregation of Israel could express sorrow over their national loss. Theologically, the book served to help the people maintain their faith in God in the midst of overwhelming disaster. Jeremiah teaches them how to submit to the judgment that's befallen them. He aims to lead those to God who would not let themselves be brought to him through his previous testimony regarding that judgment while it was yet impending. And he yearned for them to cast themselves upon the mercy of God. I'm not sure how many of us have actually even read the book of Lamentations before. May, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I am a little curious as to, as we're moving through this year of Bible engagement, if maybe this was your very first time there earlier this month to read through the book of Lamentations. And I don't know about you, but if it's really quiet where you're reading your Bible and you start to open it up to the book of Lamentations, you will hear your Bible go, because it's not used to that part of the scriptures. I don't, I don't know if that was your story here. In these five chapters, in the middle of the book, you find a glimmer of hope. Chapter 3, that's what we read earlier. That's kind of how almost all the prophets wrote during their ministries. Yes, there's judgment. Yes, there's warning. But there's also going to be just this little glimmer of hope that is rooted in what God will do. And I'm not sure if you caught this from earlier um, when we read our scripture reading there in Lamentations 3, but one of the greatest songs of worship in our day came straight from this passage. We sang it earlier, great is thy faithfulness. I, I don't know about you. I, I don't have a problem with songs that have these and thous and all that stuff to it. It doesn't bother me. You want to know why? I know it's not really relevant language, but you want to know why that doesn't bother me? I think it's okay if we have language that is strictly for God. I think it's okay. Uh, I, we don't talk like that in our everyday lives, you know, but I think it's okay if we have language that is strictly for God. And, and you may disagree with me on this point. I'm going to sleep just fine tonight, okay, <laughs> and wake up loving you. Um, but it, it's fine. But the writer of this song, Thomas Chisholm, he faced his fair share of suffering and chronic illness, and yet he always leaned into the faithfulness of God. That's really the bottom line of the book of Lamentations. Here it is. We weep. We weep, we all do, but God will give us back to joy. But the way back, the way back is through repentance. Here's what I came to say today. Lament orients our hearts back to God where we find joy. And he desires to use us to help others come back to him. Let me say that again. Lament orients our hearts back to God. It's where we find joy. And he desires to use us to help others come back to him. Now, before we dive into the book of Lamentations, I want to start with this question. What breaks your heart? What breaks your heart? I suppose the answer could be any number of things, from sickness to losing a loved one, watching your kids rebel, not getting the promotion, being let go from your job. Failing the test that you studied so hard for, grading the tests that you worked hard to write for your students. <laughs> Teachers cry too, you know. Insurmountable financial hurdles. The first Christmas with an empty seat at the table. Little caskets. I don't know what causes you to weep. I don't know what breaks your heart. But whatever the answer is to that question reveals something significant about you. Did you know it's the same for God? It's true for God as well. We're made in his image. And so we kind of have to ask the question, what breaks God's heart? What does he weep over? Because the answer to that question will reveal something significant about God. 
And what I want to do is begin with why the people of Israel were weeping. And so we go to Lamentations. I'm going to back up just a little bit here. Chapter 1, verse 16. Look at what Jeremiah would write here. He says, I weep because of these things. My eyes flow with tears, for there's no one nearby to comfort me, no one to keep me alive. My children are desolate because the enemy has prevailed. Zion stretches out her hands. There's no one to comfort her. The Lord has issued a decree against Jacob that his neighbors should be his adversaries. Jerusalem has become something impure among them. The Lord is just, for I have rebelled against his command. As Jeremiah is writing this, he is personifying Jerusalem. So as we read these verses, he's not just referring to himself. He's referring to all of God's people. And the reason that the people were weeping was because of their sin. They were in distress because of generations of rebelling against God. And it's the same for us. We weep because of sin. Period. We weep because of sin. Our own sin and the sin of others in this world. It is clear, both from the book of Lamentations as well as the book of Jeremiah, that the destruction of Jerusalem is attributed to the sins of the people. The reason they're weeping now is because for generations they had not wept over their sin. Rather, they celebrated it. They honored and celebrated their sin. Sound familiar? Let's remember that you study history. As long as sin and brokenness are honored and celebrated, the only result will eventually be pain and suffering. And James chapter 1 makes that glaringly clear. Lamentations 3 also directs us in this, that we should heed it as a warning to allow our hearts to break over sin right now. Jeremiah, as many of the prophets do, they seem to indicate that if Israel would have repented earlier, they would not have experienced the suffering which God promised would come. And at this point, that's exactly what's happening. James Smith would go on and write this. Consequently, the younger citizens have been carried off into exile. The older have been left behind and must now struggle for survival in the destitute city. Yet, as harsh as the suffering was, it was justly deserved. Because the city had rebelled against God. Yahweh was righteous in executing this judgment. In order for us to learn how to weep over our sin, I think it would be good for us to examine the way that Jesus wept over sin and brokenness. Because God weeps too. So what breaks God's heart? Who's ready for some New Testament? This morning. For those of you who have journeyed with us this, uh, thus far this year, uh, we've been in the Old Testament. We started in Genesis and we're making our way through the whole Bible this year. Um, and I realize that it's been quite a bit of a journey. Just hang with us for a few more weeks. We'll get to Matthew, okay? But um, look, the Old Testament is rich. The Old Testament is rich, but who's ready to come home, right? John chapter 11, uh, we see this account of when Jesus' good friend Lazarus died. Jesus went to the tomb to raise him from the dead. He knew in advance that he was going to be resurrected. But in verse 35, John eleven thirty-five, 35, we see Jesus wept. That's the whole verse, two words. Jesus wept. And I don't know about you, maybe you grew up going to church camp like I did. And uh, every year in the back of our camper booklets, we'd have a list of scriptures that we could memorize for points for our family group. John eleven thirty-five 35 was always there. And I just have memories of 14-year-old boys going up to their family group leader going, uh, 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 John 11, 35, Jesus wept. Nailed it. <laughs> yeah, way to go. Good job, Luther. Proud of you. Um, but I, I kind of have to ask this question. Why? Like, wh for what purpose? Why would Jesus weep? He knows that in a matter of minutes he's going to see his friend again. Why weep? I can't help but think that Jesus allowed his heart to break when he saw the result of sin and brokenness in the world he created. He allowed his heart to break. Too often we are tempted to react in anger first. We are a frustration first culture. But I think a more Christ-like approach when we can be like Jesus is to allow our hearts to become sad first, not mad first. Oh, there's a place for righteous anger. Just wait. 
Actually, we're going to see this in Jesus here in just a moment, but I believe that he starts with sadness. And maybe we should, as always, take our cues from Jesus and just do what he did. Moments later, Jesus would step toward the tomb, and in verse 38, it says that he was deeply moved. Your, your version might say that he was troubled in spirit. The original language gives the idea of that of a, of a war horse that is snorting in battle, ready to charge. In other words here, Jesus is angry. Jesus is angry. When he sees the people crying around him, the brokenness, the sadness, the weeping, he is troubled and angry over what sin has accomplished in the world as if his own broken heart's not enough. He looks around at all the other people who are destroyed by this brokenness. He becomes angry. Do we lament over the brokenness in our world? Does it break our hearts? When a good friend comes to you and says that they are, it reveals they are struggling with same-sex attraction, or they just come out right out and say they're gay, and the world celebrates this, honors this, do we allow our hearts to break over that choice? When an addict stumbles in to celebrate recovery on a Monday night, because they don't have anywhere else to go, nothing's worked. They're at the end of their rope, rock bottom. Do we allow our hearts to move toward them with compassion first? When families on the north side of Springfield remain in the cycle of poverty and dependence because of bad habits and choices, just never ending, are we jaded? Or do we initiate ways to help in the name of Jesus? Let's get real personal here. When the authority of Scripture provides the needed Bible spanking that we all need, convicting our soul, do we respond with a broken heart over how we have stiff armed the one who loves us best? When was the last time you had a good Bible cry? I guess the first thing I just want to say is a recognition. We weep. But I pray. I pray that we weep over the things that make God weep. As we continue through Lamentations, I want us to notice two more things. Lamentations 3 tells us that we remember. We remember God's faithfulness. Oh, yeah, we weep. But we also remember his faithfulness. Now, we've already read these verses, but I want to revisit them. Chapter 3, verses 20 to 24. I continually remember them and have become depressed. And yet, I call this to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish, for his mercies never end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say, the Lord is my portion, and therefore I will put my hope in him. One of the greatest ways that we can respond to the things that make us weep is to remember the faithfulness of God. Recount his wonderful deeds. This is exactly what Psalm 9 verse 1 tells us to do. I will recount the wonderful deeds of the Lord. So count them and count them again. Just remember them, recall them. Chapter 3 verse 21 of Lamentations says, I call this to mind. Bring it back to mind. One of the reasons that we are challenging Northsiders in this year of Bible engagement all the way through Scripture is so that in a shorter amount of time, a year, we can have the entire gospel, entire good news of Jesus in the context of Scripture so that we can recall it. One of my Bible college professors, Drew Ashwell, he would say it this way, when the world pokes you, you should bleed Bible verses. Know the word. Remember God's promises to his people. Recall what God has done in your past and in the collective past of all God's people. I really think that's about the only way that we're going to make it through the stuff that makes us weep. Let's be honest. <laughs> we are not all great students of history, let alone biblical history. But did you know that, that biblical history is your history? It would not be uncommon today to find a devout religious Jew who might start a sentence like this. When we crossed the Red Sea, what? You didn't cross the Red Sea. But they so closely align with the story of their ancestors that they have made it their own. And in Romans chapter 4, we find that by faith, 
we belong to that same family. So this is our story too. And as we become students of biblical history, we're better able to recall what God has done in the past so that we can recognize his faithfulness in our present. My faith history, my own faith history, goes back further than when I was baptized on May 8th, 1988. My faith history goes back further than when my father was baptized on February 4th, 1960. I know when he was baptized. I just didn't want to get that out in public. Um, my, my faith history goes back further than anything I could romanticize about the 1950s. My faith history goes back further than July 4th, 1776. It goes back further than Plymouth Rock, further than Martin Luther, further than Constantine, further than the apostles. My faith story goes straight to Jesus. And I suppose you could even make an argument that my faith story begins before the ministry of Jesus on the earth. My faith story goes all the way back, I believe, to Genesis chapter 12, where God calls Abram, and he promised to make him into a great nation, and that all the peoples of the earth would be blessed through him. That includes me. And ever since then, ever since Genesis 12, my faith has been strengthened and built upon the endless litany of God's goodness, faithfulness, power, healing, provision, strength, purity, righteousness, mercy, kindness, unceasing love, generosity, stubborn grace, on and on and on it goes. That is my story. And for those of us who follow Jesus, that's your story too. Don't tell me God hasn't been faithful to you. Don't tell me God hasn't been good to you. You're forgetting your story. And your story is bigger than you. We've got to remember what God has done. Not just what he's done for us, just what he's done. Period. Like, you know that memory is powerful. Memories are powerful. But do you want to know what's almost just as strong as memory? Agreement. Agreement is as powerful as memory. I, I recently heard a story by Matt Chandler, or excuse me, a sermon by Matt Chandler. And in the sermon, he tells the, the, uh, about the power of agreement. He says, you know, we know that the enemy, the devil, is an accuser and a liar. We get that. And he deceives us into believing certain things. But the power of those accusations, the power of those lies, actually enters in when we agree with him. Here's how Chandler puts it. He says, many of us believe the lie that we can't pray. He says, people come up to me and they say, I, <laughs> I can't pray. I don't know how to pray. That's a lie. And you've agreed with the lie. Can you say, God... I don't know how to pray. That's a prayer. I've had people come up to me and say things like, who, who am I to, to speak on behalf of God? <laughs> who am I? That's a lie. You've agreed with a lie. Can you tell somebody, Jesus loves you? I think you can. I'm afraid that we've given the enemy more often than we care to admit the power within his own lies when we agree with what he says rather than what God has already declared. Know the word. Remember the story. I, I would like to wrap up this flyover of Lamentations by looking at a couple verses. One is in Lamentations 3.25. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the person who seeks him. The Lord is good to that person. And then chapter 5, verse 21, Lord, bring us back to yourself so that we may return. The last point in our text reveals this. We return to God. Yes, we weep, and yes, we remember his faithfulness, but third, we return to God. The point of Jeremiah's ministry is this. Now is the time. Now is the time to return to God. Warning after warning, generation after generation, God gave his people chance after chance to repent of their sins and turn to him. There's this consistent thread that runs through scripture that God desires his people to turn away from their sin and to turn back to him. That's called repentance. That's the word we assign to that, repentance. 
And we're very often quick to believe in Jesus as our Savior, but when we are confronted with the challenge of leaving sin behind, we celebrate the grace, we ignore the command. But repentance is commanded. When the earliest converts to Christianity were pierced to the heart because of what they did to Jesus, and they asked Peter, what do we do? In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is not a suggestion. This is a part, a necessary part, of responding to the gospel. And, and, and what we're talking about here is not just necessarily confessing the stuff for which we've gotten caught, you understand. That's just called regret. And I think that Jesus speaks into this in Matthew chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. He talks about hell, and the word that he attaches to it is Gehenna. It was the trash dump in Jerusalem. It was outside the city wall. It was constantly burning because of the kind of waste that they put in there. That's all the detail I'll give. It's constantly burning. And Jesus said that, that hell is Gehenna. It's the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, he says. Now, I kind of understand weeping. I kind of understand like, what that looks like, sounds like. But what about gnashing of teeth? What, what does that look like? What does that sound like? I think the gnashing of teeth sounds kind of like this. It's the sound of regret. It's the sound that says, I missed it. Hell is bad, not just because God is absent forever, but because forever it will be a place of weeping and the sound of regret. But repentance, repentance is expressed through godly sorrow. That's what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7.10. He says, for godly sorrow produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret. And I love what Gareth Reese says in his commentary on the book of Acts. He says, repentance involves a change of intellect, a change of emotions, and a change of will a wholehearted decision and determination to forsake sin. A wholehearted decision and determination to forsake sin. With everything in me, I leave it behind and pursue Jesus. And some of us might be thinking, ha, that's impossible. Like, th th that's impossible. You're right. In our own human abilities and powers, it is impossible. Do you understand that we need Jesus to turn to Jesus? And when we turn to Jesus, we get Jesus. We need Jesus to return to Jesus. But when we turn to Jesus, we get him. This is where our tears turn to joy. That's why the way to joy is through repentance. Because I finally get what I really need. I get Jesus. That's where our joy is found. And when we turn to God, we find a joy that eclipses any of the weeping that we've experienced. I, I love this imagery in Revelation 21 of the new creation. We see that death and crying and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. And I find great hope in that. But before that verse, it's actually in the same verse, chapter 21, verse 4, John writes these words. He, being Jesus, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. I think that the picture that John is trying to paint for us is this. Whatever tears we've experienced in this life up to this point, the pain of brokenness in our world, our own sin, our own regret and lack of devotion, or simply just the hardness of life, whatever kind of sadness and weeping we have experienced in this world, it will be Jesus himself who comes so close to us that he can reach up, touch our face, and wipe that last tear away for good. I find great joy in this. That day is promised to come to us. But I think that we get just a little taste of that day every time we repent. Every time we turn to God, we get just a little taste of that day. And I want to wrap up here this morning with um, some space. Some space for three things. First of all, just a, a quick recap of where we've been, and then I want to give some specific ideas on how to obey this passage and then leave some time at the end so we can pray about this together. First of all, just a quick recap. Uh, we weep because of sin. That's just a recognition to help us show some compassion to people. 
We need help showing compassion. We weep, you weep, I weep, we all weep, everybody weeps. Let's just show some compassion to people. That's just a recognition. But the second two things, we remember God's faithfulness and we return to God. This, these are responses that align us to God's mission. The first is just a recognition to help us show compassion. The other two are things we can do. They are responses to align us to God's mission. So I just want to get real practical and specific about how we can put this into practice. Because in order to be the kind of disciples that Jesus wants, we must be obedience-based, not just knowledge-based. It's not enough to walk away and think, well, that was interesting. Instead, we need to put these things into practice. So let's talk about the practice. How do we weep? How do we do that? Well, Romans chapter 12, verse 15 tells us to weep with those who weep. Weep with those who weep. Humbly enter in to the sufferings of others. Don't hold people at arm's length. We go to the broken in their brokenness. And you don't have to go very far to do that. Uh, a number of weeks ago, our lead minister, Wayne, and I um, went on a prayer walk on the north side of Springfield. We were walking, praying, asking the Lord to lead us to people that we could pray with. And sure enough, we went to a lady who had been outside all night. She slept outside of this uh, business, and uh, she's on the ground. She doesn't have legs. She's sitting next to her wheelchair and her belongings, and um, I was reminded of something that day. Everybody's broken. Some people just have a little bit more polish than others, and I'm not talking about her physical appearance. What I'm saying is, as soon as we asked, hey, can we pray for you, she just burst into weeping. We're all broken. Everybody in this room is broken. Some of us just have more polish than others. And if a person's brokenness and pain is their own fault, do not harden your heart to them. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 14 says, Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, but whoever hardens his heart falls into calamity. Watch out. You harden your heart to people, watch out. You're going to fall into calamity. We can speak the truth in love while having empathy in our hearts for the person. And I think it's important for us to learn how to exercise empathy. But before we attempt to correct the problems in this world, I think we need to start with enough compassion to do five things. I'm going to put them on the screen here. Five things. Listen, learn, lament, love, lead. This is how we weep. Listen, learn, lament, love, and lead. We're going to leave those up there for a while, but I want to break them down. First of all, listen. This is the way that we start weeping with those who weep because when we rush to conclusions about a person's situation, we aren't listening. And I think we all can agree that there's nothing to be gained by the social media rants where no one's given the chance to listen. If it's not a format where people can listen, don't waste your words. We have to start by listening to someone else. Second of all, learn. Did you know that your personal experience is not the totality of the human existence? It's true. We've all got things that we can learn, ways that we can grow. We've got to start by learning more about the gospel. Let the gospel inform you first before your news feed, and then learn, how to learn from other people. Ask good questions. Learn how to ask good questions. Get curious. Don't assume the goal here is to have understanding. That's the goal. Third is to lament. This is where we allow our hearts to break because you understand empathy begins with our understanding in the brain and then the gravity of that situation draws itself toward our hearts. And remember, like we said earlier, lament orients our hearts back to God and the relationship with God becomes deeper. This is what happens when we lament with one another. The relationship becomes deeper. Learn how to truly let your heart break with people. Number four is this, love. In a culture that misaims love all the time, it's vital that the people of God demonstrate the love of God well. Our culture, to our, to our culture, love is love. Sounds really good. But the Bible says that God is love. 1 John 4, 16 goes on and it says that the one who remains in love remains in God and God remains in him. You see, real love is not found in love. Real love is found in God. 
If we want to really know love, we have to find it in God. So how do you love people that are not in God? Well, you do it the way Jesus did it. You start by showing dignity. How do you love people with whom you disagree? Well, you, you do what Jesus did and start with kindness. Love can confront sin. It's supposed to. <laughs> but it will always begin by giving dignity first. Think of John 8. In John chapter 8, a woman who's caught in the act of adultery is brought to Jesus, and his very first words to her are, who condemns you? I don't. And then his second words to her are, now go and leave your life of sin. The order matters. I think we ought to just do what Jesus did. You know, I believe that love doesn't label people. Hear me really clearly on this. I'm, I'm not talking about how we can never judge the fruit of someone's life. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that labels or those broad generalities rarely help. In Dr. Alveda King's book, King Truths, she would say this. She said, labels are sticky. Putting labels on people are sticky. It's kind of like the old bumper sticker on a used car. Good luck getting that off. Right? It's, it's not going to happen. And even if you can get that label off, it will more than likely leave a residue for life. Labels are sticky. And love doesn't do that. The, number five, the last thing here is to lead. Look, in case you're thinking that all Christians are supposed to do is just passively listen to the voices of others and then show them kindness without any amount of influence going the other way, you're wrong. God has called us to live on mission by speaking what's true, by being an agent of change in this world, and by prayerfully enacting his will on earth as it is in heaven. But I would argue that it, we can't realistically lead people, we can't realistically guide them, influence them, and direct lost people to the culture of Christ if we have not done the other four things well. Do not be ashamed of the gospel. Don't chicken out from an opportunity to share the truth. But please, please make sure that you are not neglecting to listen, learn, lament, and love first. I think that's how we can weep with those who weep. Secondly, how do we remember? How do we do that? Do you have patterns in your life that remind you of what God has done? Do you read and treasure his story in your heart by regularly engaging with his word? Do you commit it to memory? These kinds of disciplines will help you remember what he's done. They'll provide strength for you when you weep. You know, we're, like I said, we're about uh, over halfway through this year of Bible engagement. But once this is over, what then? Have we established new habits? Or are you going to check the box and just move on to the next program? We have to have systems in our lives to help us remember. Because if our enemy can keep us from remembering the story of God's faithfulness, then we will forget who we're destined to be. Last of all, some ideas on uh, just repenting. I, I know this is going to sound super simplistic. How do we repent? We just keep turning to God. I don't know what else to say. Don't give the enemy power by agreeing with his lies that you've gone too far. What do you need to forsake? What do you need to leave behind? And don't just pivot. I can't tell. Ever since 2020, I've heard the word pivot more in my life than I've ever heard before, right? COVID. But look, if... if if sin is like going south and we're like, well, I'm just, I'm going to pivot. I'm going I'm to control my response. I'm going to go south, southeast. No, 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 that's not repentance. Uh, I'm going to go east. Mm -mm, that's not repentance. As long as we try to control our response, it's not repentance. Because repentance points us straight to the Lord. And we trust him with the results. That's what repentance looks like. I'm sure many of you have seen episodes from The Chosen. Uh, we've mentioned it on multiple occasions around here. Um, I, I would encourage you to watch it. But in the opening title sequence of each episode, you're going to see a pretty simple bit of animation. Fish. <laughs> lots of fish. Fish and names. And you're going to find lots of gray fish moving together in a particular direction. But every once in a while, you're going to see this gray fish turn change its identity, and go the other direction. And when it does, it finds itself going against the flow. 
Repentance will mean some opposition, folks. But do you want to know why a pattern of repentance is hard? It stands opposed by the enemy and by the culture. Don't be surprised by the opposition. If anything, know that you're moving in the right direction. I'm hoping today, just in in some training on this passage, that we can put these things into practice. But maybe what we need today as we close is a brainstorming session. And I'm going to be in our decision point area out these doors. I would love to, to visit with you and to pray with you about other ideas, ways that you can put these things into practice. Um, if you're watching online, you can fill out a form there on our website. You can see on the screen there uh, how to get to that web address, and we would love to respond to you in that manner. Uh, but before we stand and sing, uh, I know that what we really need here is prayer. To put these things into practice, we need the Lord's help. So I'm going to ask that we would pray together. I'm going to give you a few things to pray over. You can just put it in your own words, and then I'll close in prayer, and then we'll stand and sing together. Let's pray. Would you take a moment and ask the Lord to break your heart for what breaks his? Pray that God would help you to remember what he's done for you. Bring it to mind. Call it to mind. Help help us, Lord. Pray that God would make you an ever-repentant person. And what do you need to turn away from right now? Ask God to bring someone to mind right now. Someone that you can ask to hold you accountable to this teaching this week. Who can hold you accountable to obey? Ask that God reveal that person to you right now. Ask that God would bring someone to mind right now that you can share this with this week as a witness of who he is and what he's teaching you. Who can you share this with? Ask that God would reveal that person to you. Lord Jesus, you are our hope. We want to obey you in these things. We know that you're faithful. We can count on you. And even when we weep, we can rely on your renewable mercies for us. So help us to choose you. Use us to draw others back to you. You are our joy. And we praise you, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we sing together?